Hello, welcome to the Friday, October 1st, 2021 edition of the Sands and its Storm Center's Stormcast. My name is Johannes Ulrich, and I'm recording from Jacksonville, Florida. BBC is reporting in an interview with security researchers that it's possible to launch a machine in the middle attack against Apple's Express Transit payments. Quite a few larger cities around the world are supporting Express uh, Transit. And what it really means is that you're able uh, to pay using your iPhone without having to actually unlock your iPhone. So it's meant to be a low friction way to check in and check out as you enter and leave a particular public transit system, similar to what in the past you would have done with a paper ticket or sometimes with an RFID ticket specific uh, to a particular particular transit system. Now, the vulnerability here apparently only affects a visa. So if you have a visa card registered uh, with Express Transit, and it's your classic machine in the middle of vulnerability, where an attacker would place a device close to the victim's iPhone, then relay the information across the internet to a second device that's close to a payment terminal. The attacker would then modify the data and um, would be able to change the amount as well as the destination of the money that is being withdrawn from the particular card. Now this was reported to Apple and Visa about a year ago. At this point, it has not not been fixed yet. It appears to be more of a Visa problem versus an Apple problem. And Visa states that the attack isn't really practical, given that it does require the attacker to uh, play essentially uh, this machine in the middle attack. So lots of moving parts here, and they also point out that the attack was only demonstrated in a lab. Of course, uh, you could also argue that it was demonstrated in a lab because it would probably not be sort of safe and ethical uh, to do it at an actual terminal using an actual stolen phone. And that's sort of uh, one of uh, the attacks that's possible here, since you don't need to unlock the phone in order to use Express Transit. This is a reasonable, a plausible way for someone who has a stolen phone uh, to uh, monetize this because you don't need to know any passcodes or you don't need to unlock any face ID. You just have to swipe the phone next to uh, this specific uh, device. Since you have to specifically enable Express Transit, if you haven't done that yet, uh, then there's no risk uh, to you. And again, appears to only affect uh, Visa cards. There is not a lot of detail about the attack out there. Also, for ethics reasons, again, uh, no idea yet if Visa will eventually fix uh, this vulnerability. And the New Zealand CERT uh, published an interesting tweet stating that the FluBot malware is actually using warning banners in order to uh, trick users into installing a malware. Now, fake antivirus, of course, is nothing new. What's sort of interesting here is that uh, the fake uh, red banner that you'll see, and uh, this is typically affecting Android devices, is specifically telling you that uh, FluBot is infecting or has infected your device. And it's then, of course, offering a fake security update for install, which is then the actual flu bot. So uh, pretty interesting here how brazen they are in uh, trying uh, to get their uh, malware installed. And I'm sure users will fall for it uh, because it uh, looks actually uh, pretty good and sort of similar in style as some of uh, these uh, safe browsing malware banners. And SecureWorks wrote up an interesting weakness in Azure Active uh, Directory that would facilitate brute force attacks. Brute force attacks, of course, are always possible. It's a question of how quickly they are being detected. And that's exactly uh, what this is all about. You're essentially able to brute force accounts without leaving any log records of unsuccessful login attempts. The weakness here is 
Azure Active Directory seamless single sign-on. Uh, the idea of uh, this protocol is that if you are logged in to a workstation that's connected to Active Directory, you're automatically logged in uh, to your Azure Active Directory account. And uh, this is typically done via Kerberos and Kerberos, of course, a pretty good uh, protocol. The weakness comes into play with older software that doesn't do Kerberos, but instead authenticates via username and passwords, which is also supported by this protocol sort of as a fallback uh, option. And that's exactly where uh, no errors are being logged if a username and password combination is wrong. So an attacker would be able uh, to brute force usernames and passwords undetected. Well, it's uh, Friday again, and uh, today we have uh, Chris DeWeese, another sans.edu student with us here to talk about a research paper. Uh, Chris, uh, could you introduce yourself, please? My name is Chris DeWeese. I've been in the SANS uh, master's program since 2018. I'm a security engineer at a Fortune 500 company, primarily focused on operational technology security. So your paper was about expired domain. And of course, we all love to own domains. Uh, not sure about you, but I know myself, and whenever there's a New idea I have, hey, let's register a domain, and they sort of keep accumulating. But of course, for larger companies, that's even more of a problem, or? Right? Yes, and so this is something I've thought about as the domain. I also collect domains like most security engineers, I think. Um, and the problem that has come to mind is, what if I don't want to pay for that one anymore? And is it okay to give it up? So that's even further complicated for a company that may have chosen a domain and used. And so I was... Originally, when I did this research, I wasn't sure how many domains expire on a daily basis, but I quickly found that it's 200,000. So that's uh, you know, a million domains every five days that you could choose from that may have been used extensively or not used at all, but uh, have a lot of information possibly tied to them to, to look at. So in order to investigate this, uh, what, what did the experiment look like that you uh, performed? Decided I needed a framework to help uh, get that 2000 down to something that uh, is more reasonable. So I looked for data sources and attributes that would help me understand uh, what is a valuable domain, something that it may have been used before versus not. So some of the pieces of information I looked for was, uh, is the data available in the Wayback Machine? What type of uh, search engine optimization and backlinks were tied to the domain? Um, are there related top-level domains from different organizations that they used? Uh, one that I was a little tough to find, but I eventually found a source was had the domain been f used for email. So because email was going to be my primary source of research to understand if uh, they were still getting emails to the domain, uh, even though the domain had been shut down. And then there was a little bit of OS OSINT required to understand how the domain was used previously. Yeah, so um, you basically then registered those domains again and checked what traffic uh, was still hitting, um, related host names, related uh, services. Uh, what did you find there? Yeah, so I uh, one tool that I used uh, very extensively, at least to select domains, was expireddomains.net, and that gave me ability to uh, use my uh, criteria to down-select uh, Unfortunately, I wasn't able to automate it. But once I down selected down from down to 10 and then completed the open source research to get down to five, I essentially set up a catch all domain, catch all email on that domain and then started looking at the emails that were coming in. Um, and so. Um, so I imagine if someone still had an account and a website registered uh, using an email address tied to that domain, uh, theoretically, you could have reset that password and such for that. Right? Absolutely. And this is something that I thought you should uh, think about not only for expired domains, but even domains within your company as people leave the company, you know, they could still have emails that are tied to that. Uh, and you may want to think about, especially if you're a small company, if there's a way to disassociate, disassociate yourself from those uh, accounts or allow the member to. Um, what I saw specifically in the five domains I had is one account that actually got a 
email that appeared to be tied to a Google Workspace administration account and another that was tied to someone's LinkedIn account. Uh, The LinkedIn account was especially interesting because I did not know this until uh, I had done this research that LinkedIn gives the ability, like some websites, to just get a special link via email to log into the site. So basically, if you control the email, you control the ability to log into the site. I think Slack does that too, or sort of that passwordless authentication becoming really popular these days. So really what this comes down to is using the email address as identity, then ties your identity to the domain. So if you lose the domain, you lose your identity. That's sort of uh, what this comes down to. Correct. And uh, the, the other thing that was interesting, so the, the Google Workspace account, um, I all the, all the accounts, but that domain got multiple emails, including a lot of spam. That one account, I got one email. That was it. And I even checked it yesterday to verify that the email, the, the catch-all email is still working because I was like, how can I only get one email to this account? But I did get one. It appeared to come from Google. It appeared to be tied to the, the admin account. And as I thought about it as a, a defender or what, what they may have been doing is they may have set this domain up only to use for administration, yet uh, it, it was still tied even though they've lost control of that domain. Uh, so part of me as a blue teamer thought maybe me poking around to see if uh, it was real or not caused some alarms, but uh, I was never, ne- never able to b- validate that. And the, the identity information that I would have needed to... Uh, try to log into that Google account uh, it was just too tough in the time frame that I, I had to write the paper. Yeah, and you probably don't want to go too far with the information that you're collecting uh, there either. Correct. Uh, yes. Now, when you re-register the domain, I think uh, what I've observed sometimes is also that uh, people are basically just watching uh, domains that are being registered and then are sending uh, spam or you know, are trying to scan it. Uh, I guess a a domain that doesn't receive any spam has some value there as well. Or are you going to keep that just to have an address without spam? Yeah, I think it's going to be useful. So, I I mean, I've registered all the domains for a year, so I'll hang on to them and see what happens. See what Um, happens. (laughs) But uh, I did did because I was concerned about the data that I potentially get based on seeing what other research had provided. I did set these up with a provider that had secure secure email storage so that um, should I get my hands on something that was, you know, I, I didn't want to have, I could easily uh, make sure that it wasn't lost. Yeah. Uh, now, uh, so any recommendations? Uh, I have some domains I really don't want to pay for anymore. How should I go about uh, disassociating myself from them uh, properly? Yeah, I think if you've never used them before, it's pretty easy. You can let them go and... And it's fine. But if you have used them, especially for email, you kind of want to almost do one option is to do what I did and just make, if you don't have a catch up, catch all email and you have a service that provides it, you could set that up and monitor what comes in. Um, another idea I had that I wasn't, I wasn't able to experiment with is just uh, reduce the, that, the, the usefulness of the domain. So one thing you could do is essentially submit your domain to spamless as a spammer and get that so that if someone came across it and did want to use it for spamming, it would be difficult for them to do. I guess the other side of this is, you know, you're purchasing domain that had been used in the past. Um, Any checks that you can perform to make sure that this is not a poison domain in the sense that uh, you'll receive a lot of spam, that it is on block lists and such, uh, because you're going to be stuck with all the traffic that had been going to that particular domain in the past. Yeah, that was that was a tough one. I really didn't uh, find a good resource other than to, of a resource that provided kind of the quality of the domain, other than the, the different attributes that I had. Uh, but one thing I it was able to do once I had control of the domain, and I I think this is a resource that m- many people may not be aware of is have I been pwned? Well, actually, many people probably have, are aware of Troy Hunt's work to create have I been pwned, but you may not know that as a domain owner, you can go there and get all the addresses tied to that domain and whether they've been tied to breach data. So it's a great service if you have a domain that at least understand the emails tied to that domain that may be out there that could potentially be abused or used for spam. 
Yeah, so that's pretty cool. Uh, the link to the paper will be in the show notes. It's already published in the reading room, or it should be there. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. And I've gotten at least one question on so, on the pipe paper, so that was uh, fun to have. Thanks uh, for joining me here. Uh, thanks to everybody listening, and uh, talk to you again on Monday.